Project, uh, which we'll have uh, Rebecca ask you, talking about drug policy voices. Uh, just before I introduce uh, Rebecca, if I can tell you about a, a couple of things uh, that we've got coming up, and also ask you to uh, switch your microphone off and your camera off during the session. Um, it's being recorded and um, so also to reduce uh, any background noise, we would really appreciate it if you do this. Um, if you have uh, occurs to you uh, questions during the presentation, you can use the chat function. Um, we've got Sarah Fox in the background who's making everything happen and she will uh, take note of that and, and, and we'll address those questions or at the end of um, Rebecca's presentation, um, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask those questions yourself. But please bear in mind that it's being filmed and, and it will be put online. So if you do um, uh, want to ask those questions individually, you will be picked up on, on that um, uh, uh, video as it goes up. Uh, just to tell you a couple of things that we've got coming up. Um, we've got our next uh, in our webinar series is Andrew Bennett, who is presenting on adverse childhood experiences and in particular in relation to substance use. That's on the 14th of October, again at one o'clock. Then we've got a couple of things in relation to uh, enhancement drugs, image and performance enhancement drugs. Drugs. We've got um, well, my professorial lecture is on the evening of the 9th of November. Then we've got an international conference on the 10th of November. We've got speakers from Australia, the States and across Europe, and it should be a, a really interesting one. Again, that's going to be um, live uh, online and recorded. Uh, but there'll be the opportunity for, for interactive sessions there for people to ask questions. Then for our uh, final um, uh, seminar in the series on uh, stigma and substance use and that is James Morris and Dr Alexandrescu uh, and that is on the bottom bit's gone off my screen sorry do you want it, someone chip in with the date for us December 15th Thank you uh, much. 1 till 2 30 p.m cheers thank you for that and uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Rebecca um, Rebecca Askew is a criminologist. She's got a broad interest in substance use, um, um, drug policy, illicit drug markets, and I think particular uh, focus is around um, drug policy voices uh, and people who actually use drugs, making sure that capturing their experiences and views. Um, uh, she's done work involving uh, drug treatment evaluations, uh, studies uh, of the life course in relation to substance use, um, and as I say, a whole range of uh, studies around uh, capturing drug policy voices. Uh, this particular piece of work uh, encompasses mixed message, uh, methods um, looking at engaging with people who use drugs. Um, uh, Rebecca uh, first came across at uh, uh, Liverpool John Moores University where she was uh, identified as a, a researcher with, uh, with, with great potential and it's great to see her at Manchester Met uh, fulfilling that potential uh, 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 and more. So uh, it, it's a great pleasure to introduce Rebecca. Oh, thank you very much, Jim. Um, yes, uh, I haven't done one of these before, so um, I will see how I go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to switch off my, my video and then I'm going to put it on again at the end. Um, so I'm going to try and do that now. So you don't see my Tracy M in art installation bed uh, with cat. <laughs> okay. So stop video. Okay. So, um, Thank you for joining us today on this Wednesday lunchtime. Um, I really appreciate you all kind of taking the time. Um, a, a kind of good point to kind of talk about the Drug Policy Voices project. Um, this is an ESRC funded project for which I'm principal investigator. And we are unbelievably going into our final year of the project now. Um, and so this is a really good opportunity to share kind of uh, where we are, where we've been, why we, we've got here, what we've done so far and what we're going to do in the future. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing you with that and, and hopefully answering some of your questions at the end as well. Okay. 
So what is Drug Policy Voices then? So in 2018, I was awarded an ESRC new investigator scheme. Um, and that was to look at um, integrating the views, experiences, opinions of people who use drugs into debates about drug policy reform. So um, I'm the principal investigator supported by Dr. Melissa Bone, um, who's not with us today. She's on annual leave, uh, but yes, yeah, supported by Melissa. Melissa and I met at the University of Manchester, uh, where we were both doing our PhDs around the same time. And it was through a, a conference, actually, uh, the ISSDP conference, International Society for Study of Drug Policy Conference, that we, we kind of continue to meet up annually. I had this idea of a project. Melissa has done uh, lots of work. She's got a legal background, expertise in drug policy and human rights law. Uh, she's done uh, research and work with cannabis social clubs, cannabis activism and medicinal cannabis law as well. Um, so it was through that that we, you know, the, the conference that we met every year and we kind of built this project and uh, thankfully it was funded. Um, so yes, we've been working together for the last two years on this and complemented with my kind of sociology, criminology background and her kind of legal uh, and socio-legal studies background. So we're very fortunate to have um, some really, really um, influential mentors on this project. So mentored by uh, Dr. Robert Ralphs, who's a SUAB at MMU, he's a reader in criminology. So he's uh, my mentor for this uh, project. Part of the new investigator scheme is, it is an early career um, funding scheme and it is about upskilling. So my research has been thus far mainly qualitative research and I'm integrating mixed methods. We've done a survey. Um, so uh, Rob and uh, Professor Gary Pollock as well here at MMU have been uh, helping me with that. Uh, survey, particularly Professor Gary Pollock, in terms of the quantitative analysis as well. So very lucky to have both of those mentors on the project. Also, um, wonderfully have also Professor Alison Ritter as my international mentor. I've been very fortunate to actually go to Sydney twice in the past 12 months to work with Alison on this project. Um, she has she works at the Drug Policy Modelling Programme, which is director of that at the University of New South Wales has uh, pioneered, pioneered work on integrating those with lived experience into debates about policy reform and really really fortunate to be there um, i was there over last uh, kind of british summertime where we worked on the kind of theory and theoretical backdrop for the survey and for the rest of the project and i was actually in uh, australia uh, when the pandemic hit i had to cut my trip short very unfortunately to to come home and i was doing the analysis of the survey there um, so really really um supportive mentors there that have um you know been great for the project We've also got good support for our research from uh, drug policy NGOs. Um, we've got drug, uh, drug Science, Transform Drug Policy Foundation and uh, Release as well. And I want to thank the research team, the mentors and the support for our research. Often people are giving their time um, to supporting these kind of uh, funding schemes and, and grants. And I really, really appreciate that. So that is the, um, the team. So what is our aim then? So, Drug Policy Voices uh, was really set up because we are having lots of debates, debates about drug policy reform, but often the people that get left out of those debates are the people with personal experiences. So our idea is to integrate the voices and opinions of those with drug experiences into debates about policy reform. And this includes those that have used compounds covered by the Misuse of Drugs Act and the Psychoactive Substances Act. So, you know, various substances, cannabis, cocaine, heroin, LSD, ayahuasca, but also the use of like medications that have not been prescribed to people that people are using for various reasons. And we strongly believe in giving a, a voice to people um, who've, uh, have those personal experiences and that are routinely left out of policy debate. So that is our aim and our ethos. So how did it all come about then? So um, this is just a bit of my research trajectory from my PhD. Um, so my PhD looked at adult recreational drug use. So I did my PhD at the University of Manchester, supervised by Judith Aldridge and Toby Seddon. 
So I was interested in looking at people over the age of, of 30, that's how I classified adults, uh, people who are not typically associated with recreational drug use, often seen as kind of a young person's thing. And I, was, um, I uh, wanted to use discourse analysis. I was particularly interested in language and discourse and reasoning around substance use. And I wanted to look at how otherwise conforming citizens, so people who don't, um, they don't commit uh, crime or don't break the law uh, outside of what's associated with their substance use, how they negotiate the criminality and deviance. Um, so really looking at kind of how people account for, reason, legitimise, what kind of discursive strategies they use, who they tell, who they don't tell. Um, also interested as, uh, about their uh, views on the law. So um, insert a few years later, I uh, was successful in British Academy uh, funding. And so I was interested in moving beyond this kind of recreational substance use to look at varied meaning and motivation. And this was to, uh, to kind of look at beyond this recreational problematic dichotomy. So there was a few emerging drug trends around at the time. So an increase in people using uh, benzodiazepines, increase in people like the third wave uh, renaissance of psychedelics, microdosing, ayahuasca use, study drug use as well. So people that didn't fit into how we typically define people as either recreational or problematic. So I was interested in exploring meaning and motivation and applying kind of uh, discourse analysis there. So in both these studies, I asked people about their um, views and opinions on the law. And this was something that was really a lot more complex than I expected it to be. So I kind of had this view, certainly in my PhD, that I would ask people who use drugs pretty regularly about what they think of the law and that everybody would be very anti-prohibition, everyone would want drugs to be legalised. But actually, speaking to people, it was a lot more complex than that. Um, and I really struggled to kind of synthesise and analyse that part of the, the interviews. Um, and it was through thinking about this complexity, through reading Alison Ritter's work um, with other academics, Alyssa Greer, uh, Kari Lancaster, um, that I started to think about building a bigger project based on this, to look at this more in depth. So I applied for the SRC, and the title of that is, Does UK Drug Policy Require Reform? Engaging Drug Takers in, Into the Debate. Okay, so to set up the, uh, the study then, Melissa and I, um, oh, somebody's requesting control. Um, so Melissa and I wrote an article uh, that was based on the British Academy funding. So I interviewed 40 people as part of that project who would use a range of different substances. And I'd asked them all about their opinions on policy and their opinions on law. Um, and so this part of the project was just focusing on that. It wasn't focusing necessarily on their substance use. And we wrote a paper called Deconstructing Prohibitionist Ideology. And we used a socio-cognitive um, approach. So this was pioneered by Turn Van Dyke. Um, and this is kind of the triangle of discourse, thinking about the con con uh, cognition that's involved in language, in discourse, um, how people use power. It's really um, good in terms of kind of socio-political studies, certainly when there's a lot of resistance and challenge within people's uh, discourse. So a really kind of suitable when people are talking about policy. Um, so within this, uh, this article, which is published in the International Journal of Drugs Policy, we, uh, we kind of amalgamated these views that were very, very complex. Now, Melissa had done some work um, for her book and had looked at the kind of four philo philosophical uh, positions by McCoon and Reuter. So we applied this to the research. So this is mil Millen liberalism, which um, uh, under that kind of, that we have the right to do what we want to do with our body unless, as long as it doesn't harm somebody else. Um, the kind of paternalism, either hard or soft paternalism. So hard paternalism, drugs should be banned because they are dangerous. Soft paternalism kind of introduces things like harm reduction, education, those types of things. Slip, li strict libertarianism, um, which is associated with those that don't think the government should have any say or any rights uh, to interfere with the matters, private matters. So this was really relevant for those who were uh, within plant-based medicine communities, uh, maybe have more anarchist views. 
Um, and then legal moralism as well. Um, so that uh, so drugs are morally wrong and therefore they should be banned. And the, the participants within uh, this, uh, this study um, kind of were on the Millen liberalism and the soft paternalism side. But what we found was such great variety in those um, opinions and views. Some people had really well formed opinions and those people were usually those who had maybe worked or studied in substance use or drugs policy before. Um, some people are kind of generally anti-prohibition, but they didn't really think of, they didn't have any clarities of ways forward. Quite a few knowledge gaps. So people using the terms um, decriminalisation, legalisation uh, interchangeably just to mean a kind of reduction in criminalisation. So uh, and those who are apathetic, those that, you know, it doesn't matter what the law says, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. Um, and, uh, you know, again, this idea of symbolic power. So if you've had, if you have um, a lot of information, if you've had your own study, if you've worked within the field, then you have more symbolic power, you have more knowledge in order to um, kind of, you know, have an opinion and have well formed opinions. So we concluded from that paper then that we actually need really different strategies for asking people their opinions um, in order to engage those with uh, lived experience. So we can't just ask people, you know, do you think cannabis should be legalized? Do you think uh, drugs should be decriminalized? Because that actually assumes a lot of knowledge. It assumes that people know what legalization means that, uh, or decriminalization means. And we need different ways. That doesn't, if people aren't kind of politically activist or motivated, that doesn't mean that they don't have something to contribute to drug policy reform debates. And um, what we did find was that people um, kind of talked around these key social representations. So um, they talked about health, they talked about human rights, they talked about education and uh, economics. So they did have, there were uh, um, kind of similar things that people talked about, even if they didn't have kind of preformed opinions. So this kind of set us up for the project then, the Drug Policy Voices project. So this is mixed methods. So we did a survey early 2020, uh, which I'll talk more about today. And we're going to move on now um, with the help of research assistant we're currently shortlisting for uh, to use creative methods to increase people's knowledge and information around different policy approaches and to use this kind of uh, more value based research, which I'll talk about in a moment. So the key considerations then, uh, considering the, the previous research are, you know, how to engage a variety of people. So, you know, we say the word drug taker, drug user, people might not like those labels, people might identify with those labels. Um, but how do we engage a range of people with a range of different experiences into these very complex debates? Then how do we synthesize this information, particularly when that's really complex? And again, how do we disseminate, you know, how, you know, and will, will policymakers listen? So lots and lots of massive challenges here. Um, but what we have found is that people are generally very supportive of integrating people with experience, but there is a lot of challenges around doing so and approaches to doing that. So how to solve uh, this problem or how to try and address this problem of complexity um, in terms of opinions and knowledges and experiences. So as I say, I was very fortunate to um, work with uh, Professor Alison Ritter and her team at DPMP um, for a couple of visits over the past 12 months. And Alison introduced me to values-led research. So particularly to Jonathan Haidt and Moral Foundations Theory, also the Common Cause Foundation as well. And Alice and I have had a lot of chats. I know she's using value-based research for her, um, her own projects um, about how kind of stripping things down to people's values is a way of trying to address those complexities, is a way of getting under those opinions, knowledge and experiences. So really uh, that first visit was about, um, you know, really focusing on values and understanding values and having a values-led approach within this research. So, interested then thinking about progressive versus prohibitionist values and we tried to within the survey we separated the questions out equally um, but thinking about things key things uh, such as health and welfare so that might be our own health and welfare but also that of other people as well and um, one of the key things certainly in ha uh, hate research is around authority and conformity as well so whether we obey the laws whether we listen to government who we take advice off 
Um, so authority and conformity, I think key things that oft maybe we don't often think about when we're thinking about uh, drug policy reform. And what certainly what we found within the research is, you know, some people are more trusting of government than others. And probably we were in a period of time at the moment where trust may be waning in our current government, uh, if it wasn't so already. And particularly uh, through Melissa's expertise are focused on rights and freedoms as well. We're seeing this a lot more in people's discourses about their substance use, about uh, rights and freedoms to put what they want in their body, uh, to use certain drugs uh, that are, are currently not legally available. Um, also key things around education and advice, uh, particularly around education for young people but also thinking about education and advice for those who have maybe taken drugs for many, many years. Um, you know, are people in their 30s, 40s, 50s going to talk to Frank, you know, uh, you know, as places to go for their information and advice? And what information and advice can come from uh, those who have experienced themselves? We, we you know there's a lot of kind of peer support, um, it's certainly in treatment um, and things. So thinking about justices and injustice as well, our values around that, certainly around why uh, some substances being legally available and others not. Economic seems to come up um, within people's discourse as well, kind of talking about uh, cost benefit analysis of, of certain types of treatments. Um, and also pleasure, something that is still kind of very undervalued or maybe only seen as kind of recreational pleasure. Uh, and there's lots of really good critical drug studies work, particularly Faye Dennis, who's talking about kind of conceiving of different types of drug pressures and maybe opening up our understanding of pleasure uh, when we're thinking about uh, psychoactive substance experiences. And, uh, and finally, thinking about purity and sanctity. Again, this comes from Haight's work. And uh, really, one of the things that um, I'd noticed from interviewing people and talking to people about their substance use, that there is this, there seems to be a movement and focus maybe on lifestyle medicine, on people being clean, people um, of, of, of all substances, whether that be sugar, caffeine. Um, we've also got the kind of spiritual left as well um, and rights to drugs uh, on a spiritual level. But, um, and also on this abstinence focus. So do people have values around being abstinent? Do you know, is that something that people value that, you know, no drugs is the right way to go? Um, okay, so that's values. So that's how we've kind of approached the research in order to um, overcome some of those issues of kind of complexity of opinion and certainly within a, a survey, uh, comprehension as well. So the survey design then, um, so we collected information on demographics. Uh, I also, you know, I want to point out here political affiliation and religious affiliation. So in Haight's work, he talks about different values being important to whether you're on the left or the right side of politics. Most of his work has been done in the US, but we were really interested to, to use that as a variable to see if that kind of affected people's values. Um, uh, also children, residential status, that kind of thing. Um, substance use, we collected data about how substances that have been taken and how frequent. So lifetime, 12 months, month and past month and past week. So we, we kind of had a big debate about this, about, um, you know, who are the drug takers? Who, you know, who has got experience? And we, and we didn't limit that. It was just, we wanted people who had had lifetime use. And, and then hopefully we're going to do some more in-depth analysis about whether values changed on your historic or more frequent use. Uh, we also uh, asked questions about identity, certainly around self-identity, identifying as dependent or addicted to alcohol, tobacco or other drugs and whether they self-describe as recreational. We kind of in retrospect wish we'd asked about medicinal use but those you know whenever you do a survey there's always things that you wish you you would have asked. Um, so experiences of sourcing and supplying substances as well, uh, experiences of criminal justice and then we asked the attitudinal questions. So we went through quite an extensive piloting and data collection process. Um, so in the first draft of our questionnaire, we a, a engaged with a range of, we got feedback from a range of um, academics, uh, policy NGOs, those with lived experience as well. We did cognitive testing with eligible participants at two points. Um, 
within the, uh, the the kind of piloting phase. We did a soft launch of 15 people to make sure everything worked um, in a technology sense. And then we, we finally launched our survey um, on the 21st of January for six weeks. So quite intensive recruitment period, social media. Uh, we had lots of retweets, uh, which were, were kind of really beneficial for engaging and, and kind of promoting the survey. We used email lists. We, start, we looked at the, the completion figures every couple of days and then started to target specific groups. We had issues uh, with young people. We had a lot of kind of people in the 30s and 40s at the beginning, uh, and we managed to target young people, and uh, particularly those with conservative views as well. And we were delighted with the final uh, completed responsive, uh, responses of 1,344. So just going to take you through some key characteristics of the sample. So our average age of the sample was 36, um, which is a little bit higher than the global drug survey, for example, when it tends to be kind of in the mid 20s. So we had kind of quite equal age ranges within the decades as well. So we can make some good comparisons there based on age. Uh, fairly equally split between male and female, 1% non-binary, 2% other. Um, 94% white, uh, majority of people currently living in England, but we also had representation from Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and we had another category as well, um, because the, the criteria stipulated that people were either a citizen of the uh, UK or currently lived in, uh, in the UK. So 22% of studied had worked in the substance, sorry about the typo there, substance use field or policy. And we found this important to ask because of deconstructing um, um, prohibitionist ideology. Um, there were people who had studied in the field or worked within the field tended to have uh, different types of values and opinions or thoughts than those that hadn't. So we wanted to ask this just so we could do some comparisons. 37% children, we did ask about different ages, but I've not broken it down here. Uh, around 60% are um, in full-time work and um, uh, various others there I won't go into various okay so religious and political beliefs people weren't necessarily um, you know uh, attached to kind of main, uh, mainstream religions Christianity was uh, with 11% of the respondents uh, the SNR is spiritual and not religious so 20% um, identified as spiritual not religious uh, the nearly half the sample 47% atheist and 13% agnostic so our political views uh, then of, of the um, respondent group, 40% uh, were socialist, 29% liberal. We had real issues uh, with conservative. It was always sitting around 4% um, that kind of have conservative views. Um, well, and that's not to say that people who have conservative views don't take drugs. Maybe people with conservative views don't like filling in surveys about their drug use. Um, but we managed to kind of target some groups and uh, managed to get that up to kind of 9%. So we, we really wanted to kind of put the non-category in there because there's such variability in um, political views. And we were very aware that some people just don't, don't feel like they have political views. And I think that's kind of very telling. And the other category were people who may have said a green, um, there was a couple of people, Brexit party, and then, um, but a lot of people uh, would say that they're centrist as well, or that maybe their political views change dependent on their, um, dependent, dependent on the subject that they are uh, in hand. So um, I've just looked at lifetime substance use here, basically uh, for time reasons, but there's no great surprises here. Um, so 99% of people um, had tried alcohol at some point in their lives. Most people were more recent alcohol consumers. Uh, cannabis as well was around the same. Tobacco, ecstasy and cocaine were about the same. This kind of follows other surveys. Uh, tried as we might, we didn't get as many anabolic steroid users as, as we uh, wanted to. Um, but we tried to get kind of 10% in each category and we're pretty kind of happy with the spread there. Um, so self-report, self-identification. Um, this is quite interesting and something that we want to do a little bit more uh, research, kind of analysis into. Um, so 
most people had tried alcohol, but only, uh, and most had, had, who had, had had it in the past week or the past month, but not, only 9% kind of self-identified as addiction or dependency. Um, so that's not about recency or frequency of use necessarily there. Nicotine addiction or dependency, 36% of the, uh, the, the sample identified. Uh, and drug addiction or dependency was, was more than alcohol addiction and dependency, 13%. Another interesting thing, and this was pretty consistent throughout the, the period, was that 50% um, of the sample had a friend or family member who had a drug and alcohol problem. And this is about kind of perceptions of problems and also kind of feeding into values as well. And certainly around that kind of care and harm values. 9% uh, had been in drug or alcohol treatment, 6% have injected a drug. Um, interestingly, you know, 73% uh, recreational drug taker, 6% unsure, and 19% said no. And that doesn't mean that, you, that these groups are all mutually exclusive. So it'd be good to do a little bit more in-depth analysis of this. Okay, not going to go too much into sourcing and supply, but just to say that most people obtain illicit substances from people that they know. Um, and 81% are given or provided an illicit substance to someone else. And the phrase in there was even for free or just a small amount. So the key thing here is that the media in particular tends to separate um, people who use drug and people who supply drugs as completely separate groups. But we know, and we know from lots of uh, wonderful research, uh, Mike Salinas, Liam Moyle, Ross Coomber, looking at social supply and, and looking to kind of deconstruct those na narratives. Um, but interesting there to think about values around this as well. So this is something that surprised us. Uh, a third of the sample have been stopped and searched at some point in their lifetime. And I did have some kind of anecdotal feedback from people saying, you know, well, I'm in my 30s now, but I was stopped and searched when I was 17. Um, but this is really interesting in terms of contact and in terms of kind of policy and the law affecting people. Most of the 33% the were between one and five times. But 15% had received a penalty notice for cannabis, not a penalty note. 7% uh, had been convicted in possession. Uh, that was mainly related to cannabis. 2.5% supply offences, 2% production cultivation. So um, a research, a, um, a paper that produced with Mike Salinas was around this kind of silent majority. And, um, you know, most people aren't in contact with the criminal justice system. Um, but this kind of shows that kind of a, a, quite a proportion of people have been stopped and searched. So laws are affecting uh, those that use drugs. So um, attitudinal questions, some key highlights. So the respondents had progressive values overall. So the um, if we're looking at this in, in a kind of general sense, they agreed or strongly agreed with statements that value health. So drug policy should be a health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. Um, uh, they agree, uh, the opinions of people with, they agree that people's with lived experience should be integrated into policy decisions. So 94%, so strong agreement. So that very much validates this project as well. Um, they uh, kind of resist the stigma, so it's unfair to judge people negatively just because they use drugs, and they respect individual liberties surrounding consumption. So from that mill and liberalist perspective then, so people should be free to use drugs as long as it doesn't harm others. Um, and that drug policy should acknowledge that people use drugs for spiritual reasons as well, people agreed with that. Uh, and beyond those personal use of substances, the respondents respect broader socialist and environmental values. So drug policy should consider the impact of the drug trade on the environment and those that are addicted to drugs deserve our sympathy. So when we're thinking about health and welfare, those socialist values, liberty, environmental, there's kind of the, in general, the whole uh, sample were kind of progressive. And um, so where it became, um, a little bit more complex or uh, divided, we asked a question, um, it is unjustified that alcohol is legal and the following are illegal. So we asked that in relation to cannabis, cocaine, ecstasy, heroin, uh, psilocybin mushrooms um, and spice. And you can see here that this really varied uh, with drug, uh, associated with drugs. So we've got the, the kind of gray areas here are the neither agree nor disagree. Um, so the top parts here this is um uh this is agree and strongly agree up the top 
and then the bottoms are strongly disagree and disagree. So we can see here that 90% of respondents therefore believe that the law is unjust surrounding cannabis. Uh, that followed by, and this was surprising to me, magic uh, mushroom psilocybin. So 75% either agreed or uh, strongly agreed with that. Conversely, people disagreed that the laws around spice were unjust. So you can see here that we're more in the disagree category uh, there. Uh, so th this shows that there's kind of some di uh, division on this question as well. So heroin, more divided responses there. Maybe that's something to do with um, access to uh, legal heroin. And there's certainly you kind of discourse and debates around that. Um, and, uh, you know, people's perception. It'd be really interesting to look at this in terms of, um, you know, people's lived experience of certain substances or whether they self-identify as kind of recreational or addicted in some kind of way. So, um, so maybe this, as we can see as well, kind of ecstasy, there's another one kind of similar to, to mushrooms. Cocaine, I always call cocaine the, the marmite of drugs. So either people are, see it as a party drug that is maybe has some functional benefits that's maybe uh, not very problematic, or on the other side of things, people are very um, opposed to cocaine, you see it as associated with addiction and dependence and uh, loss of money and uh, things like that. Um, so I think that's kind of interested how divided people there and also looking at the, the neither agree nor uh, disagree categories there. Um, so we can see that, that kind of like cannabis has got a very low neutral response. So people found it more difficult to answer the questions around cocaine uh, and spice, for example. And that might be because people don't have enough information that they just don't know. Um, and we know that, the, you know, from the qualitative research that goes before, these are can be can, kind of quite complex. So again, advising people, uh, you know, so there's a question, so young people should be advised against of, and then we broke it down into substances then. We also used alcohol in there and we uh, used tobacco. Um, so the question of whether to uh, advise young people against certain drugs is also split by drug type. So this shows that respondents aren't basing their drug on this kind of legal moralism. So if it's if it's legal, then it's OK. And if it's uh, not, then it's not. Uh, but it, it's probably more to do around perceived harm of the substance. Um, so and that also indicates that although respondents may have used or tried substances, that doesn't mean that they would advise others to, to uh, use them. Um, so the key points here are people uh, were kind of more sure that young people should be advised against the use of heroin, tobacco, spice and steroids. So steroids was, you know, here really kind of agree, strongly agree, disagree. Um, sorry, so they agree that people should be advised against it. Um, but people more undecided around alcohol, cannabis, ecstasy, mushrooms. So we really want to look a little bit more into this. And as we can see, those kind of undecided as well. So people had difficulties um, looking at this, uh, this question. So moving on then to think about um, authority of the law, government intervention. So as I said before, hate is, is kind of interested in thinking about authority and tradition and um, people on the right according to his research um, are more likely to respect authority to listen to what the, uh, the government tells us so there was uh, there was kind of quite divided responses here um, so people generally disagreed that on this legal moralist position it's necessary to ban drugs to maintain law and order um, they agreed that it's hypocritical that politicians have anti-drug attitudes when they've used drugs in the past. This was something that definitely came out in our um, the, the kind of research that I did, that people are um, uh, kind of believe that politicians are hypocritical or that they uh, mistrust politicians as well. So divided on the question, we should listen to government if they tell us that drugs are dangerous. So 65% of those disagreed, um, but still there was a bit more di divisive there. And uh, it, again, it would be interesting to look at that in terms of political affiliation, um, in terms of um, a kind of whether people have um, used drugs recently, that kind of thing. Um, but they mainly agreed, so 91% overall agreed with the question that drug policy should be informed by research conducted by medical professionals. 
And this kind of gives us an indication that people aren't against, um, you know, kind of having access to information and being kind of advised by, um, you know, people within powerful positions of people within medical professions, but maybe it's the message of who is telling us. Uh, and people are more likely to listen to some people and not others. And again, I think this is really, really interesting, certainly around the past few months, and um, really kind of the public's, um, the public's trust um, of the government and the, uh, in what they're telling us. Certainly around, we can see a lot of neoliberal messages around kind of COVID-19 and uh, lockdown. Um, and again, people are kind of divided on this issue that people should obey drug laws, um, even if they don't agree with them. So 59% um, disagree, but there was kind of a high neutral response then. So something um, also really useful for uh, future analysis. So when thinking about this, this is one of the, the key things that Melissa and I are developing at the moment, is this intersection between harm and rights. Um, so we saw before that um, re respondents really respected personal freedoms to take drugs, uh, with 83% uh, of people agreeing with this statement. Uh, so people should be free to use drugs as long as it doesn't harm others. Uh, and there was only kind of 10% neutral there. Um, but when we asked the question, people should be free to use drugs, even if it harms themselves, this was much lower. So only 52% agreed with that. And there was a much higher neutral response there. So when we think about harm and when we think about, um, you know, drugs causing harm, then this may seems to intersect with rights. Um, so the kind of people have personal responsibility to control their use. 86% of people agreed with that statement. Um, and this is something that's really come up with my previous research. So I wrote an article in 2016 called uh, Functional Fun. And people really within their discourses and within their language talked about their ability to function, function and control their substance use. So when we're thinking about, you know, uh, individual versus um, state responsibility there is kind of high high kind of personal responsibility there kind of leading into these more neoliberal kind of rights um people should be able to grow or produce drugs for their own personal use so 78 percent agreed uh, with that um but then the question and this kind of flummoxed us a little bit so people should aim to be completely drug free so this was aimed to kind of hit those who were maybe believe that abstinence is the right way forward um and um or those that are kind of on this kind of clean living uh, like kind of lifestyle kind of detox that we should be free of all substances um, so 47 percent so around half disagreed but really high our highest neutral response here 38 percent and this could be that some people think that maybe some people should be drug free but others not um, so that might be something that's going on there. So that might be something to do. It might be something to do with people's um, ability to control. Uh, but this is something that we really want to look at um, when we're thinking about our um, uh, qualitative research. So that was a bit of a whistle stop tour then of um, the kind of key findings. As I say, we are, we have been kind of halted certainly in the analysis phase because of COVID lockdown, working from home, the kinds of support that I was, um, you know, had and the kind of really immersed analysis that I had in uh, working at DPMP and then transitioning to home uh, working. It uh, means that the in-depth analysis has slowed down a little bit, though we're starting that now. We're just uh, in the process of um, kind of getting some RA support on that. Um, so the kind of the moving forward then, thinking about developing the qualitative fieldwork, creative methods, using values, also uh, people um, to try and kind of educate and inform at the same time as well. So we really want to do something creatively here and really something that will help increase people's knowledge. One of the things that we're going to do in terms of dissemination is over the next year, produce a number of podcasts. So that will help disseminate the research on a wider basis, other than just what's kind of published in peer review articles. And of course, COVID considerations as well. So what kind of fieldwork we can do, whether it's online, whether it's offline. Um, so these things really need to be considered and, and something that we'll be doing over the next um, few months. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I would be very interested to hear your comments, your thoughts, your questions. Um, as I say, this is something that, um, you know, is going to be my main focus over the next uh, 
few months and I'm really excited to uh, to kind of get going on this again. So if you um, you don't answer a question here or ask a question here, if you want to get in touch, then please do via my email. You can also look at look us up at drugpolicyvoices.co.uk. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, that, that that was fascinating. It was really enjoyable, and um, I think it shows um, the importance of language as much as anything. There was there was some fascinating um, elements to that in um, in how we use terminology interchangeably and how it, it isn't the same thing. It, it it really came to light where you said about how. Um, the, near the end you said about the categories over you should be allowed to use if it doesn't harm others and even if it harms themselves those two questions are used interchangeably usually usually and i, I and they are completely different answers you've got from it which mm. i suppose shows the complexities which haven't really been unpicked before Mm. Yeah, and I think as well, thinking about that when, you know, looking at the variables about whether people have got friends and family members who have got, you know, a, a drug or alcohol problems, your own, you know, own perceptions of things. I think it's, I think, though, you know, from speaking to people, that question in itself really kind of flummoxed people, you know, like it was one of those ones that you really had to consider, uh, you know, where, where, where do our, you know, where do your ideas about your human rights and personal freedoms kind of uh and harm kind of come into it yeah i, th I think over the aims as well uh, and how uh, the high levels of people who think that we should aim to be drug free but i suppose mm -hmm. if you say that people should aim to always be completely honest and everything they do they should yeah. aim to be um uh, loyal and trustworthy and everyone you know it, it, having those aspirations and having the realism isn't often unpicked um, mm -hmm. so, so that, that's fascinating and um, can i open it up to people uh, for, for any questions uh, sarah i don't know if there was any that came through on the chat uh, no nothing's come through in the chat um oh right no i tell a lie people have just started to comment um Wolf says thank you. No questions. He's got to go. Um, he was not surprised by your mushroom finding. And um, he thinks people see them as natural and therefore beyond the parameter of state interference. Mm -hmm. And it correlates with strong support from home brewed and grown. That came from Wolf. Can we pick up on the mushroom one? Because I, I was wondering if you, you must sort of mentally try to unpick it, even if you couldn't analyze all these things. Is, is there an age factor in there and how it's changed in for, for people my age they, 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 they may have a different view of when they were a teenager and how it's seen uh, now yeah i think that's something that we really want to do is kind of start to analyze this a lot more in depth and look at those different variables um you know certainly around age so thinking about the kind of young people and advice you know is that affected by whether that person is a young person it is that affected if the uh, if people have children what ages those children are so all it's all really really it's going to be interesting to kind of you know this is such a just the highlights at the moment and yeah, we we want to get really deep deep down and dirty into the analysis now. Yeah. There's um, um sorry. Sorry, there's a question here for Jen, from Jennifer Stedden as well. Um, have you got plans to take this further and use the responses to try and have a direct impact on drug policy? Um, yeah, so we are, we have, um, I should have said for our research support as well, I, I left out that actually um, we've had support from uh, the Conservative gr Group for Drug Policy Reform, also for the All Par Parliamentary Group for Drug Policy Reform, um, Jeff Smith, MP Dr Jeff Smith is in Withington and Melissa and I presented our research, he's promoted our research as well. So we are definitely engaging with uh, the people uh, the, you know, MPs and obviously drug policy M NGOs to try and, yeah, to take this, to have this, we, you know, we'd love to have a direct impact on drug policy. And I think that's something that we really need to, um, you know, consider and think about how, you know, not just as much as how do we engage with people with experience, but how do we engage with policymakers? Will they listen? Will they listen if it doesn't follow their ad agenda? So, you know, and I think there's so much good work over there with different activist groups, and it's important to, to kind of work with those as well. 
Okay, there's another question here. Um, wondering if there are any examples of alternative strategies that are more meaningful for people with living or lived experiences. Um, what, what, what do you mean by meaningful? Um, Rosalina meaningful Bryan, to engage, that. you mean, or meaningful? Uh, if you want to, to come online, was that uh, Rosaline? Oh, yeah. Is she coming on? You don't have to, sorry. <laughs> um, I don't. Okay. It, it, it maybe oh, um, someone she's... can just give us a bit more info on that one. That she's asking on behalf of a colleague. Right. Uh, <laughs> can we get some more information on that and we go on to the next one? Um, yeah. Uh... Is that, um, uh, Karen Duke. Karen Duke. Yeah, I've got it here. Um, thanks so much for the brilliant presentation, Rebecca. It was great to see the first findings of this important project. I'm just wondering about your sample and the average age of 36. That seems really old. Do you have any uh, information regarding differences between age groups? I'm struggling to find anything on involving under 18s. In um, so we one of the requirements was that people were over the age of 18 um, so we have got we've got very as i say that that part of the analysis isn't um isn't done yet so yeah that is something that we really want to look at we did have you know it does seem it did seem old to us as well and we were we were averaging at the age of 40 up until the last couple of weeks when we actually um, there was a, a festival managed to email people um, who'd been to a festival and we got like we upped our young people and um, so yeah it, it was really interesting to us certainly um thinking about that but remember as well we're talking about the, the requirement was that it was historic use as well so it wasn't that people had taken drugs in the past month or in the past week so we we're asking people who had ever taken a, a, a drug so we need to do some we need to look at the age ranges and also look at his, how historic or recent the use was as well and um, another question here regarding the podcasts um mm. is it something you would do in collaboration and possibly with people who use drugs involved in the project yes definitely we, that that is something that we really want to try and do that this isn't just uh, this is not about it won't be about us kind of talking uh, just about you know in this way that we really want to bring people in and we, yeah we we want to yeah that's something that we totally want to do and I think with the the qualitative side of things as well it is to work with particular people and particular groups um on those creative methods as well you know and we're we're going to be working on that but yeah mm -hmm. Um, another question here. You found 87% believe drug policy should be health issue rather than criminal justice. What do you think about NHS giving over most drug and alcohol services to others as it was deemed not core business? Yeah, I think this, you know, I think this is a, a, a difficult one. And I think this is the thing about um, values. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of when when people are talking about kind of values, and this is the kind of complexity around this is that we have a kind of in theory uh, discussions about what we want and we need to really break these things down these things are so politically motivated as well and you know privatization I, you know i've not worked within uh, drug treatment but certainly thinking about privatization of of kind of criminal justice and things like that and being things being put over to kind of privatized companies um, you know, it's it, it's a yeah, it's a it's a more complex question than often a, a survey can do. And this is why I haven't done surveys before because I feel like, you know, there's so many buts, there's so many what ifs in terms of that, and that's what we're going to try and address. These issues we're going to try and address with the qualitative work. I think it's really uh, demonstrates about terminology and and while. Um, a lot of NHS provisions gone, it's been picked up by third sector. And it may be argued that third sector may be um, in some ways able to respond to needs uh, rather mm. than NHS. So it is, there's a lot of different things which I think only the that qualitative work appeals mm. to tease out. Mm. 
and we definitely want to you know engage with people who have experience of treatment of spirits of different treatment services and you know to re you know one of the key things that we want to do with the qualitative work is you know ask people what would make your life better you know like what you know what kind of things would make your life better and that to come from from people um one comment here i'll read it out um i feel as a recovering addict that the government should not have been given consent for cannabis personal use it contradicts all the leaflets they made and sent to mental health workers to give out many young people suffer with psychosis i worked in mental health for nine years i also suffered with it please can you send the link for future talks and your website again thank you um links to rebecca's website will go out um in a follow-up email while well, i'm when i'm going to email you the link um, to this live recording next week so I'll make sure to include Rebecca's um, website link and, and contact details. Yeah and please do email me as well I'm really interested to you know like I, I really want to hear from from people who are interested in this project because I know so many people have got passion and enthusiasm um, certainly for the qualitative phase so yeah please do get in touch and um, you know I'd be you know really happy to hear from people. We've got one more. I think this can be the last question. Um, it's a long one, so bear with me. Wonderful lecture as always. A quick thought question. Should the voices of illegal drug users be considered in a vacuum in relation to influencing policy? You have importantly included alcohol and tobacco in this study. So should such studies seek to influence policy within these fields? Should we seek to engage caffeine users to influence policy pertaining to its availability and regulation? My concern here is that identifying drug users as illegal drug users may risk further stigmatization and reinforcing dominant sociocultural constructions a long and rambling comment my apologies yeah this is <laughs> Stuart this is true to true to form thank you um <laughs> but yes I you know I, I I am you know terminology and terminology for this survey as well was something that we agonized over and I think you know I, I, I feel like we're stuck between a, a rock and a hard place sometimes by saying the term drugs, saying the term substances. And yeah, I, I totally, as you know, completely um, agree with your points that we shouldn't see people as illegal drug users and legal drug users. And, you know, it, it's, but it's really difficult. But if you're doing a survey, one of the things was that if you say drugs, that people understand what that means. When you start to do surveys that are saying substances that may or may not be, um, you know, covered by the Misuse of Drugs Act, it becomes too wordy for a survey. Um, and this, again, is why we want to do that qualitative research. And I think one of the things that's going to be really important is to, to break down this, this, uh, this language. Some people are, will take um, a strong identity as, as an addict and want to assume that identity and other people find that identity incredibly stigmatizing so I think one of the things is that it, when it comes down to, to people is it's about what they want to identify as um, as well and I think what other questions have you put there yeah it, we're, we're so, I think it's so important to say alcohol tobacco and other drugs you know, as well, you know, thinking about, we didn't put caffeine in there, um, but certainly, yeah, when I've done uh, lots of uh, interviews, sugar is always talked about as well. Sugar is the new demon drug. So, um, yeah, but okay. thanks, thanks, Stuart. i am just checked there's nobody on mic who wants to ask a question. I'm seeing a few unmutes at the moment. Nobody wants to come on mic and ask a question? No. Um, hello. Uh, hi. Um, hi. Hiya. I'll just say that I'm actually 58 because I noticed you mentioning age uh, about it being younger. I'm actually 58. I'm the woman who said about uh, the leaflets yes. in mental health uh, trying to discourage uh, younger people up to the age of 34 using cannabis. Mm. But I totally... Um, value that because from my own experiences when I was younger um, I did once go on a psychiatric ward you know um, through using drugs and drink and working too hard and got partying too hard uh, but it was a frightening time and there was another later time in my life when things weren't going well 
and I was um, very ill off it. And when I was working in this service, the early intervention service, the amount of psychosis and seeing how bad it can get, mm. it is frightening. So I do wonder why. I mean, currently I had a situation with my neighbours and I spoke to an old school friend who's just come out of the police uh, as a police support officer. And I, I said, you know, what are they doing smoking weed anyway in the morning? Blah, blah, blah. And she said, they're allowed to now, as long as it's only for personal use. So it just seems mad because young people especially... If they're using it regular, it's not. It's, it's going to elevate a lot of things like depression. Mm. But psychosis is terrible where it can go. So I just wanted to mention that because that that's my little bugbear at the moment. Uh, I am a recovering uh, alcoholic as well uh, and an addict. So there's a few reasons. Uh, I just wanted to mention my age as well. Thanks for listening. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Thank you. And I think that just illustrates the, the complexities uh, and I suppose some of the confusing messages that um, uh, are put out uh, and uh, how they're received uh, uh, around uh, legal status and around even when things are identified as being harmful, what do we actually do about it? And I think your work is, is, is really bringing a lot of that to light. So mm -hmm. on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank you, Rebecca. Uh, and also to say that I suppose, I mean, I, I know, Rebecca, it goes for anyone within SUAB, uh, and I think it, for any drugs research, is people want to hear people's views. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's not always people feel comfortable raising them in situations like this. Bang people an email off. People do want to hear everyone's views and share those opinions. Everyone's mm -hmm. view is valid on this. So thank you all for your time. Um, Sarah will be sending out... Um, uh, reminders are over forthcoming events and um, I hope to see you again soon so thank you very much thank you everybody thank you everybody. thank you too thank you bye bye uh, hi guys